Now that we know what a neighborhood is, we'll look at neighborhood functions, specifically focal and block statistics. After that, you then decide, okay, what type of summary measure do I want to create from the cells within my neighborhood for each cell in the output raster? And we have two types. The black ones here, majority, majority, minority, and variety. These are applicable to nominal data. So that's differences of kind. Things like land cover, land use. The ones in white are applicable to continuous data. So continuous data, things like temperature, elevation. ArcGIS doesn't know whether what the numbers it's being given within a raster are. It just sees numbers. So ArcGIS will allow you to use all of these on any raster. But you have to know whether or not the thematic layer you're working with is continuous or categorical to know whether or not a particular measure for summary would be applicable to that particular raster layer. So we can get the majority, the minority, or variety for raster layers that are categorical, or if we want to have assigned to the focal cell of a continuous thing, things such as the mean, the most common thing in a focal. So the mean, median, minimum, range, standard deviation, sum. All possibilities. So you have find, define the neighborhood, then you decide which of these things you want for um, creating the new output layer. Then you can use them together. Here, for example, first look at the Um, diagram on the right hand side so it's a bit of a DEM and I'm going to use a low pass filter or mean filter on that so my focal fit uh, my focal feature will be um, a mean computation for each focal feature in each neighborhood it's also called a low pass filter because what it does is it reduces high frequency variability it's a smoothing filter so in Photoshop that would be called a smoothing or blur filter. So yes, these are things also in, you also find the same types of things in Photoshop or any raster analysis package. The difference between Photoshop, of course, is that, well, Photoshop is not uh, uh, a GIS based, doesn't hold spatial information and stuff like that. But they also have filters. So if you just look at the diagram, that's the original and that is with the focal mean. And you can see right away that what happened was things became less sharp because a blurring happens. And that's the trademark of a low pass or focal mean filter. In Python, I just have my raster. It was elevation. I call that in RAS. Then I defined my neighborhood here as a nine by nine cell neighborhood. The larger the neighborhood, the larger the smoothing effect. So a three by three would have would have had less of an abrupt change than a nine by nine. Uh, 11 by 11 would be even more than 9 by 9, etc. Obviously, the limit of, of that as you get very, very large is going to be 
one value, which would be the mean of all the cells. So if I, had a, if I had a neighborhood, let's say that was my focal cell here, and my neighborhood happened to be this big, well, then it's just the average of the whole data set, isn't it? And pretty much the average of the whole data set as I move, you know, right in here to the next cell, to the next cell. And so if you have an inappropriate neighborhood size, like one that's super large, you're not going to have anything except for values that are very close to each other. And sometimes if it's large enough, they'll all be the same. So if you had a neighborhood that was way larger than your study region, all of the values assigned to each cell will be the same. So once we have that neighborhood defined, we then use focal statistics. That is the function that takes in the raster and then the neighborhood that we defined right above here and the function we want to use for each computation within the neighborhood to be assigned to the focal cell. So in this case, it says, hold and make a new raster called V. And V will hold the focal statistics from the in RAS right here, which is the elevation, using a neighborhood 9 by 9 cell, and compute the mean and assign that to each output cell. Here's a categorical example using focal variety. So variety just means the number of different kinds of things. So variety measures the number of different kinds of things within the neighborhood and assigns that to the focal cell. So here on the right right now, you can see a land use data set. Once I run a focal variety filter over that, it would look like this. It now becomes a semi-continuous variable using natural numbers. So we have one two, three, four, five, six, seven. One means that within the neighborhood, there was only one kind of land use. Seven, wherever that occurs, and it's hard, you can't see them on here, but there's a few sevens in there. They're red, I'll just say they're there. Well, around those particular cells in those groups, there were seven different types of land use or land cover. And this type of thing is obviously used a lot in, um, you know, ecology and uh, landscape management, you know, in that you want to find, let's say, areas that are ecotones, where they have maximum biodiversity. Well, ecotones are where you have transitions between ecological groups and where you have transitions you will have the most different kinds of land covers, let's say. And those are regions that might require protection in a new development, for example. Or where you'd want to sample for catch and release programs or whatever. You're going to find ecotones very um, used by a lot of different species, birds, mammals, amphibians. And so you can identify those quickly with focal filters. You can see where things are more, um, where there's more variety and where there's less variety. Another one is the majority for categorical data. So here we have our land use going in again. A neighborhood rectangle, same thing, 9, 9 cell. And then we have focal statistics. That's our input raster, the neighborhood we define. 
and we choose majority here. Majority means the most frequent type. So what is the most frequent type of, let's say, land cover that occurs within each neighborhood that's nine by nine and assign that to the focal cell? This is like a low pass filter. So it, it operates in the same manner as a mean filter for continuous data in that it will reduce high frequency variation. So for example, if I have a, if you just watch areas like up here, you can see there's little green, little green spots over here and here that are of different color than the majority around them. They disappear in a focal majority filter. So let's have a look. So those disappeared from up here. Now it's all one color. So the focal majority then can, is used to clean up high scale uh, high, high frequency variability or noise that might be in a categorical data layer like that. So that's one of the main uses of it. And just looking in this little area. One of the issues with focal majority is that you'll see after running it, there can be no data regions. So all the little white parts in here that you're seeing. So you're seeing these little white areas. And these little white areas are cells that had no clear majority within the neighborhood. And so that's one problem with a focal majority filter. If there is no majority, then it outputs nothing or no data. And so these artifacts, you won't necessarily see them when you're zoomed out all the way, but you have to zoom in to see them and they're there and they can affect subsequent analysis. So filling these little no data regions after using a focal majority is very important. So the other option, of course, is a majority filter. So if you're only interested in a, um, three by three filter. So if you don't need to use a larger neighborhood filter like a nine by nine or seven, seven or 11, 11, et cetera, then use the majority filter function. Because if there is no clear majority, it will just choose one or the other to fill in those cells by automatically. So you don't end up with no data. So it uses whatever's the majority um, within the, the eight cells surrounding the focal cell. Here, for example, is that same as a, as a region after using the, the majority filter zoomed in. And here you don't see any of those little white, no data cells. So you won't end up with that issue and having to then fill them up with something afterwards. So there are many raster functions or neighborhood functions that are employed in many spatial analyst tools that you just don't see. But neighborhood functions or convolutions of various kinds are basically what's being done in slope, aspect, hillshade, um, point densities, et cetera. The majority filter, low pass filter, high pass filter. Uh, fil no, neighborhoods are used in nibbling, shrinking, expanding, cleaning boundaries, aggregating, etc. So a lot of these you don't define your own neighborhood for because they're part of the built-in algorithm, but they're there. So neighborhood functions are in a lot of things in ArcGIS Pro. A lot of raster functions require neighborhoods being used in some way or the other. So getting back to our issue that if we're needing to use a larger than a three by three neighborhood 
for categorical data to clean out that high frequency variability or noise, we end up with these areas which are no data. Again, zoomed in here. Boundary clean is one function that will ensure that it fills in those no data things. So it will fill in the no data um, function when there are equal number of classes surrounding it. So again, we use focal statistics here. We get a we get our what we see right there. And then we send the raster itself to something called boundary clean, which is a built-in function. And so what that will do is it's going to modify the edges somewhat, and not just where we have no data, but it will also modify all the edges a little bit, depending on what the, um, what the values are within the edges, within the neighborhood that it has built in, which is a three by three neighborhood. So look at this now. So I just click click, you'll see that it changed the boundary in here from the previous iteration. It also makes the boundary slightly more smooth than they were before. But there are no, no data cells anymore. So that's one way to do that. But at the same time, it can expand areas into other areas. So this little area here could have been, is expanded a little bit into the darker green. So it modifies the data. Uh, maybe, although it's on a very small scale, that may be significant and something you want to avoid. If you want to avoid modifying all the boundaries and just fill in, so you just want to fill in the no data after, after using a focal majority, you can use nibble. So nibble fills no data values with values of their nearest neighbors. So for each cell, whatever its nearest neighbor is, it will fill in the value. So this won't modify areas that have data already. So areas like you see here where there's no no data, it won't modify. It will only modify the cells where there are no data. Now, this requires a little bit extra because we need to have a mask, a mask layer where there are no data cells are the ones to be filled. So for example, here we have our focal statistics, again, with using a majority filter in that nine by nine neighborhood called V. So that's this thing here that we see, that's the output. Then we use nibble. So, and I use the V here and then V again as the mask. So I have the input raster and then the input raster itself as the mask that shows where the no data values are. And I want data only nibble no data equals process no data. And this just ensures that uh, no data in the output is filled. So it's because by default, if there's no data in the input, there will be no data in the output for cells that had no data. So now watching that, just uh, as I go to it, remember, you can look here and maybe here and see how those two look afterwards. This one won't change. Use Delta for change there. This one with no data will. So the area that was modified by boundary clean stays non-modified using nibble. Only the areas where we had no data are changed. So that's the, to keep, uh, if you want to keep true to your data set, then this is the process you would use to fill in the no data after using a focal majority filter. Because this doesn't uh, affect data that had a lack of no data around it. Another thing we can do is expand. So expand specifies a group. So here, for example, we might have a group one would be the yellow, two would be the, the brownish, three might be the 
the bright green um, four the mid green five the dark green etc so each of these zones has a value right the zonal ID and we can say grow or, or should say should expand one zone at the expense of others let's say we know that um, because of a priori information that whoever digitized or collected the data about let's say this zone here can't remember what we called it let's call it like a three again so zone three that that green and we know that that was underrepresented in the data that was um collected so underrepresented means that there are less cells that should be the dark green because of bias in the collection of the data so to remedy that we can utilize the expand function to expand that class or any other class at the expense of surrounding classes so that we correct that bias in the data itself and it's pretty straightforward we take a raster like this one here that you're seeing and let's say we want to expand zones park and rec and wooded area all by one cell so that means they'll grow along the boundary by one cell for the parks and rec and wooded areas so we say v equals expand in raster the number of cells one so that's the number of cells to grow by and then the zone values that we want to apply that growth to which is four and eight in this case the parks and rec and the wooded area so watch now if I as I click my um, uh, forward in the pen so what we can see here is you saw that difference the dark green zone grew and by growing it gobbles up parts of the zones that are adjacent to it it's the only way it can grow and so that may correct correct the over representation the under representation of that group in space obviously obviously this is also useful in testing what if scenarios right you know what if uh, the city has a policy to increase the amount of green space what would our city look like or what areas would be most affected by that policy well you could use a expand to figure out what these areas would look like after they're expanded and then quantify adjacent areas to see which ones are affected more than others all kinds of uses for expand opposite of expand shrink so it just does the opposite of expand it shrinks by a number of cells so let's say instead we know that uh, the existing parks and rec and wooded areas are all over represented because of uh, the way they were produced or digitized well we can say shrink th this raster here by one cell for zones four and eight and so all the other zones will eat into those ones so watch the green areas now here they, most of them disappear so you can think of that for example uh, be, beforehand we had green areas you know which could have acted as let's say wildlife corridors corridors the dark green ones the wooded areas but if we're told in reality these things just don't exist anymore because of um, the uh, what, what, one thing that happened with those along all the farmers fields of course is the uh, the infestation of the um, uh, oh now I forgot the name of it the tree anyway there's a tree in Ottawa ash yes yeah, so the ash emerald ash borer there we go the emerald ash borer so we wanted to look at a scenario well how was this landscape going to look you know with the emerald ash borer getting all the ashes uh dead and that's what happens so you can 
you can visualize that scenario using a shrink for those wooded areas. The other type of neighborhood function, block statistics. Block statistics part, uh, I should say, um, uh, partition, partition the raster into a set of unique blocks of cells that are not overlapping for each block. And then all cells within a block have a summary function assigned to them or a summary function applied to them. And then the output is given to the cell at the center of the block. Then the block moves over by one block unit. Same thing. Summary values going there to that cell. Block moves over. Oh. Block statistics are the second type of neighborhood function. Blocks partition the space up into a set of unique blocks of n cells by n cells. Like so. Then a summary value of all the cells within each block is applied. Let's say like a sum of all cells. Then that sum is assigned to each cell in the block. So each block then in the output is a homogeneous value for each cell. Then the block moves over by one block unit, has no cells overlapping between the first and the second block. And then the same thing happens. The summary function, let's say it's a sum of all the cells is applied to the block and then every cell gets that same value. And then it continues on doing the same thing over and over again. So there's not overlapping and there's no focal cell with blocks. All cells within the block receive the summary value that was applied to that block and its cells. Here's an example, a three by three blocks. So that's a nine cell block. We have block statistics instead of focal statistics, our input raster. And in here we define the rectangle, the size of the block. So previously we stored that in NBR as a separate variable. That can still be done, of course. So this is just for convenience and to illustrate that we can, within a single statement, just include this part here as the definition of the neighborhood, or the block in this case. Or we could say store it in a separate variable, and we could have then just gotten rid of that and put the NBR up here variable. Either way is the same thing. The same effect will happen. This way it's just in one single statement instead of two. So we have the block defined. And we apply it to our image and then it would look like this. So notice here as well that it looks like there is an increase in resolution. In other words, uh, the resolution became larger. Whereas what's happened is the resolution is still the same, but because each block has homogeneous cells in it, and each block will be rectangular, right? Because they're, it's, a, it's a nine by nine block of cells. So those nine cells all have the same value. So there's one nine by nine block, for example, and it shows green. 
the dark green. And it looks like it's less detailed, but in fact, the same number of cells are the, as, as we find in the input or in the output. This doesn't change cell sign, size, it just changes the appearance or has the appearance of changing the cell size. And it's often used as a step before changing the cell size when you are scaling data, particularly when you're scaling up data. So that means going from a high resolution to a lower resolution. For example, you might have to, you might be working in a region where you're working at a 30 by 30 kilometer or 30 by 30 meter cell size because all your layers in 30 by 30 meters or your least uh, accurate layer spatially is 30 by 30 and all the other ones are, let's say, at smaller resolutions. And so if you need to scale up data, either categorical or continuous, from one resolution to another, coarser resolution, then what you need to do is first create the block statistics version of the higher resolution images, such that the block size is equal to the resolution of the coarser image, like 30 meters. Then once you've done that, and let's say you've taken a mean is one way to do that, to take in the average of the uh, cells in the block and assigning them to each cell in the block. Then after that, you would resample. You can resample at that point using nearest neighbor to your coarser cell size to actually change the cell size. Visually, it would look the same, but you'd actually have a larger cell size in that case. So you remember that from the example um, on the durian, where we had to upscale the elevation layer. So let's look at an example now. In a study of soil chemistry, how many different land uses are there within 500 meters of sample points? So you have a set of points, which are samples, and you want to figure out how many different land uses, how many different, and that means a variety, there are within 500 meters of the sample points. So a cartographic model for that would look like this. We have a land use layer as input, and we have sample points as input. So that's input A and input B. We then summarize using focal statistics and a focal variety within a circle of 500 meters or as close as we can come, we compute the variety. Therefore, every cell in the output here so every cell in the output has the number of different land uses within 500 meters of it. So that layer by itself then contains the variety of land uses around each cell within 500 meters. Then we need to just look at the cells that coincide with our sample points B using the extract values to points function. So we put in our variety land use, VL use, and the sample points. We extract the values at the sample points, therefore having afterwards a tabular output in this case, where we have sample point, and then variety. It was always going to be at least one, right? Like so. 
And so we then have successfully figured out the number of different land uses around each of the sample points to be used, let's say, in a multivariate analysis to try and understand the effects of the environment on water quality. So neighborhood functions are used for many purposes, smoothing and generalization as we've seen, like the moving average method or low pass filter or mean filter. Um, for edge detection, filtering and remote sensing. And again, you can, you can make custom filters in ArcGIS for that. And there's some filters just for remote sensing um, already built in to the image analysis toolbox. Local majorities, most frequent class to generalize or upscale for noise removal, for just cleaning of your data, or for you know, trying to figure out the dominant types of um, categorical data, categorical value within your data. Slope aspect curvature, all forms of neighborhood operations. Figuring out ranges between min and max, let's say searching for elevation changes within a defined radius. So you might have um, something something to do with habitat suitability where you need the range and elevation over a particular distance. You can get that as well with neighborhood functions using you know, um, neighborhood maximums, for example, neighborhood minimums. 